Good evening, everyone. Welcome, everyone, in person and online to Israel and Palestine, the history and the conflict. My name is Jessica Chiraboga, and I'm a 24 and the president of the Dartmouth Political Union. On behalf of the DPU, we want to thank you for joining us for tonight's conversation on the Israel-Hamas war and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The DPU is the preeminent, nonpartisan, student-led political organization at Dartmouth College, and we are dedicated to promoting open discourse on campus. To that end, the DPU hosts speakers from across the political spectrum, holds both student and expert debates, and organizes campus-wide discussions on relevant political issues. The DPU believes that advancing the robust exchange of ideas is the responsibility of institutions of higher education in a free and open democratic society. At Dartmouth, students have historically led this charge. In the late 18th century, literary societies were founded by students and functioned as nonpartisan forums for dialogue on public affairs. Today, we at the DPU root our mission in this very history and continue this tradition of furthering dialogue on issues of societal importance. The topic of tonight's panel has prompted serious debate across higher education and our worlds more generally. We understand that students, staff, and faculty need avenues to engage in robust dialogue and discussion on this topic, and we view tonight's panel as one such opportunity. We acknowledge that this panel may not explore every nuance of this topic, but we encourage Dartmouth community members to continue engaging with each other after this panel. And as I stated earlier, advancing the robust exchange of ideas is the responsibility of all of us here and online in a free and open democratic society. I would now like to introduce the moderator for tonight's panel, the Vice President of the DPU, Dylan Griffith. Dylan is a member of the class of 2025, studying government on the international relations track and public policy on the legal studies track. I would also like to welcome our panelists, Professor Usama Makdisi, Professor Rachel Fish, Professor Halid Al-Gindi, and Professor Guy Ziv. Dr. Usama Makdisi is a professor of history and the chancellor's chair at the University of California, Berkeley, where he teaches courses on Palestinian history and US Arab relations. He was previously a professor of history and the first holder of the Arab American Educational Foundation Chair of Arab Studies at Rice University in Houston. Dr. Rachel Fish is a visiting assistant professor at George Washington University, where she teaches Israeli history and society. Dr. Fish served as a special advisor to the Brandeis University Presidential Initiative to counter anti-Semitism in higher education, and is also an associate research professor at the Cohen Center for Modern Jewish Studies. Mr. Halid Al-Gindi is the director of the Middle East Institute's program on Palestine and Palestinian Israeli affairs and adjunct instructor in Arab studies at Georgetown University. He is also the author of Blind Spot: America and the Palestinians from Balfour to Trump. Prior to his current role, he served as a fellow in the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution and as an advisor to the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah on permanent status negotiations with Israel from 2004 to 2009. Dr. Guy Ziv is an associate professor at American University where he teaches courses on U.S. foreign policy, international negotiations, U.S.-Israel relations, and Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking. He appears frequently as a political commentator for major media outlets, including CNN, and BBC. So with that, I'd like to give a quick round of applause to our, all of our panelists after those biographies for welcoming, for welcoming us and, and joining us here. So as always, any views expressed by our panelists are not endorsed by the Dartmouth Political Union. Tonight's panel will begin with a moderated Q&A, followed by an audience question and answer period. If you'd like to ask a question, one of our DPU ambassadors will be there in the aisle holding a microphone for you to use. We ask that attendees ask questions and let the DPU ambassadors hold the microphone for them. Thank you all once again, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dylan. Thank you again. Thank you, Jess. I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us tonight here at the Dartmouth Political Union. Uh, my name is Dylan Griffith. I'm a third year here at Dartmouth, um, and I'm the vice president of the DPU. As Jess mentioned, I want to recognize that the content that we'll be soon discussing has generated intense emotional responses. Uh, our panel tonight is not going to be able to address every nuance on this issue, though we will do our best 
to address some of the driving forces behind it and try to come away with a better understanding of where this conflict can go from here. I want to emphasize that in an academic setting like this, it is our mission to try and disentangle the circumstances of the events unfolding. That being said, we have invited this group of panelists with a wide range of backgrounds and experiences to elicit a diverse array of responses and perspectives. We expect and even encourage respectful disagreement. As an institution of higher education, especially on a campus like Dartmouth, we have a responsibility to hold these conversations on issues of societal importance. So a little bit with about how tonight will work. I'll begin by asking each of the panelists a question individually to elicit some of their work backgrounds on these issues and give the audience a taste of their perspective. Then I hope we can transition into a more free-flowing conversation where I'll ask gen uh, questions more generally to the whole panel. Uh, after that, I will open up uh, questions to the audience to whom I ask uh, that your questions just be asked with respect for the expertise of our guests. So with that, we will jump right into it. First up, Professor McDesey. Uh, in your latest book, Age of Coexistence, The Ecumenical Frame and the Making of the Modern Arab World, you describe a long history of coexistence between Muslims, Christians, and Arab and Eastern Jews in Palestine before the British took control after World War I. What did coexistence look like before the British mandate, and how did it change with the arrival of Zionism? Oh, that's a, a minor question to, to open up, and uh, I mean, I wrote a book, so you want me to give an answer in a few, in a few minutes, but basically, it's good to be here. It's, thank you for, to DPU, and thank you to all the students uh, for, for being here, but in essence, the argument of the book was, was, was to sort of shed light on a history of coexistence that is extraordinary in the Ottoman Empire and before the Ottoman Empire in the Arab East, specifically, that goes back centuries and centuries. And the idea was to dispel this myth that people in the Middle East are only sectarian or only think in terms of religious identities, antagonistic religious identities, and to highlight the fact that there's a profound history, a variable history of coexistence that depending on which time and period changed. But the point is there was a history and a culture of coexistence. The idea of Muslims and Christians and Jews living together was not controversial, wasn't even remarkable. It was just a fact of life, but again, Historians will always tell you it depends which period, when, and how. The second part of your question is that all this changed um, in terms of Palestine, um, obviously with the advent of, of Zionism, <coughs> colonial Zionism in Palestine, in the sense that the Zionist project uh, that was developed in Europe and that originated in Europe and not among the Jewish indigenous communities of the Middle East or Palestine, um, the European Zionist project was trying to answer European questions European racism, European anti-Semitism, European nationalism, and so on and so forth. It's a very long history of Zionism that you can go look up. But then it came to Palestine, and the problem in Palestine, of course, to answer your question briefly, is that Palestine was inhabited by Palestinians, or the people we refer to today as Palestinians. How do you create a Jewish state, and by what right do you create a Jewish state in Palestine at the expense of the indigenous population? Clearly, a Jewish state is not compatible with coexistence. Um, insofar as it, it was forced on the native population and led eventually to the Nakba of 1948, that is to say the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians in 1948. That doesn't mean that we can't recover aspects of the history of coexistence because the point is our part of the world, the Middle East I should say, is a part of the world that is rich in coexistence between Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And assuming we can sort of resolve um, or we're not here to resolve issues, but that we're here to acknowledge the fact that there's this history of coexistence that once the, the, uh, the, the, the current sort of colonial project um, comes to, uh, changes into a project of, of equality for all peoples living in Palestine and Israel on the basis of secular equality, then we can recover these aspects of coexistence. That's a very short answer to a very big question. Thank you. Um, Professor Fish, in the United States, we've seen a dramatic increase in anti-Semitic incidents since the October 7th attacks. You've written that both the political left and right perpetuate anti-Semitism. Can you describe what the similarities and differences between the ways in which they employ anti-Semitism are? Sure, also a big question and worthy of several books and articles. Uh, thank you, DPU, thank you for having us today and thank you to the panelists to being part of the conversation. In terms of anti-Semitism, I think what 
I think is what is important to understand is that it often can be perceived as being only coming from one political proclivity. And I think it's important to be swivel-headed to understand the ways in which Jew hatred, which is what anti-Semitism is, emerges, both from the hard right and from the hard left. And we have seen that both in the context of Europe, we have seen it in the context of America, and we know that there are different ideological positions from those political identities. And for the American Jewish experience, there is a deeper understanding and recognition when it comes from the political hard right, primarily because there's a history in this country that's associated also with the legacy of anti-Semitism and with racism and the ways in which they intersect. There's an understanding, too, from the European experience, primarily with the rise of Nazism, in terms of how the Jew is identified as being the other, never being able to be whatever the society in which the Jew is living. So when you see, for example, in 2017 in Charlottesville, individuals walking around with tiki torches saying, Jews will not replace us while carrying Confederate flags and also Nazi swastikas, Americans understand that. They get it. It is much harder for many Americans, let alone even also American Jews, to understand the ways in which Jew hatred emerges from the hard left. Much of that comes from the legacy of the history of the Soviet Union and the political framing of the way in which the Soviet Union utilized Jews and Zionism synonymously, interchangeably. The idea also in terms of the ideology is not the same. In this case, Jews are deemed to be white. If they are white, they are deemed to have privilege. If they have privilege, they are deemed to be powerful. Therefore, also Zionism is perceived as being a form of white supremacy. And you hear that kind of language. Also, on the hard left, the Israel conversation and the conversation around Zionism intersects very often with forms of anti-Semitism. And very often you will hear from individuals that that is a guise or that is political you know, discourse and it's often what I have found a guise for a form of hatred towards Jews. So these are ways in which those forms of anti-Semitism exist and manifest and we see them playing out in America. And you see it not just on college campuses where we know lots has been happening since October 7th in particular, but we have seen it prior to October 7th we know that some of these intellectual frameworks have existed for decades. And we also know that what happens on campus never stays on campus. And so we see it in culture. We see it in mainstream media. We see it in politics. We'll definitely come back to that topic later um, about the role of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Uh, but for now, uh, Director Al-Gindi, you uh, advised the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah in the late 2000s. Uh, do you think that Hamas and Israel will agree to an extended pause in fighting during this latest round of negotiations? And what would that look like? Uh, well, th thank you, Dylan, and, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, uh, I guess this is the opposite of those questions. This is fairly short answer, in, and that is maybe. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think there's a great hope that, that there will be uh, an extended pause that will perhaps even turn into a, a, a de facto ceasefire. I think the word ceasefire has become taboo in Washington in particular. Um, it, we can have anything but a ceasefire. And of course the, 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 um, uh, the protest movement um, is fixated on, on, a, um, on an immediate and permanent ceasefire. So there's a big gap there. But, but the talk right now, from what I hear in Washington, there is, uh, there is um, some guarded optimism, I would say, about prospects for an extended pause. Uh, I, think, uh, I think everybody has had their fill of the carnage, everyone with the exception, I think, of the leadership in Israel and their supporters in Washington, so that's not literally everyone. But I think from a public opinion standpoint, the overwhelming majority of Americans want a ceasefire. Um, American politicians who won't say the word ceasefire at least say they want to see an end to the carnage. Um, 
but there are things that are driving this carnage, and that has have a lot to do with the politics in Israel. Um, I think contrary to what many people believe, this is not solely Netanyahu's war. Um, he, for his own personal and political reasons, would like to see this war continue indefinitely uh, because he knows the, the minute the war ends, then there will be a reckoning inside Israel, and then, of course, his, 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 uh, his fate is sealed. Um, but the, uh, the Israeli public itself is a key driving force in the, uh, that is fueling this war. Um, if you look at the polling, the, 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 the polling in Israel would suggest that most believe that, the, that, the, that Israel's response is, is generally okay, but a significant minority uh, think uh, that it is insufficient um, and would actually like to see more destruction we're talking about a situation where Israel has, uh, where everyone agrees, everyone who understands the reality agrees that Israel is using starvation as a weapon. Um, you have 80% of the world's starvation is in Gaza at this moment. This is an entirely a man-made uh, process. Uh, this is a, a man-made famine that is calculated by the political leadership in, in Israel. And it has the overwhelming support. Uh, of, of the Israeli public, and in fact, you see protests at the border crossing in which um, uh, dozens of, of truckloads of humanitarian assistance is supposed to enter, but they're being prevented not by Israeli soldiers, but by Israeli ordinary citizens who, who don't want, who want to continue uh, that policy. Um, 30,000 or so Palestinians have been killed. Uh, and so really the, the forces that are driving this, uh, this war are Israeli public, Prime Minister Netanyahu's own political future and ambitions, and American domestic politics. We'll definitely also be coming back to that. Um, Professor Ziv, uh, you just released a new book this year uh, titled Netanyahu vs. the Generals. The Battle for Israel's Future. Uh, in this book, you explore the tensions between Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the Israeli security establishment. Why do members of the security community distrust Netanyahu? And how has this distrust impacted Israel's actual security functions? So I completed the book and sent my final proofs on October 6th. <laughs> and uh, within 12 hours, it was already uh, outdated. And uh, fortunately, I was able to uh, convince the publisher to allow me to do uh, an afterward. Um, but before I, I say anything, I just have to, to make one remark in response to, uh, to a couple of my panelists here who uh, have not brought up October 7th. Uh, this is the first time, I think, in this conversation that October 7th is, is brought up. And I think that's important because, uh, yes, it's absolutely true that uh, you have an Israeli public, not all of whom support Netanyahu, in fact, most do not at this point, who are in favor of uh, continuing uh, the fighting in Gaza. And the reason is not to starve Palestinians. Um, in fact, I think most support humanitarian assistance. I certainly do, and everyone I know certainly does. Uh, the reason behind Israel's support for the war is because Israel was attacked on October 7th. Uh, it was uh, 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, which was also a surprise attack. And the October 7th assault from air, land, and, and sea was uh, the biggest uh, terrorist incident in Israel's history and the greatest, uh, the greatest tragedy that the Jewish people endured in a single day since the Holocaust. And the perpetrators not only celebrated the kidnapping of many Israelis, hundreds of Israelis, uh, all civilians, uh, most civ mostly civilians, excuse me, some soldiers, um, massacred, um, massacred young people your age, maybe a little older, who were attending a rave. Uh, many of the people who were uh, brutally killed were babies. Entire families were taken hostage. 
Some of them were peace activists. There was uh, a very well-known one, Vivian Lee, who would escort on her free time uh, Gazans uh, who were sick across the border to Israeli hospitals. Uh, there were other peace activists as well among the uh, people who were kidnapped or massacred in Tyra Kibbutzim in the, south, in the southern part of Israel bordering Gaza were destroyed. Uh, and those people are now uh, unable to go back to their homes as of today. And, uh, and Hamas has been saying time and again, if you listen to them, that uh, they're ready to do this again, that this is not a one-time thing. So of course, Israelis are united in, in, in favor of uh, getting rid of or, or dismantling, uh, crippling Hamas. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Now, I want to answer your, uh, your question. And I'll do it briefly, because I took that time to, to respond. But I think that it was an important response. Um, the reason that the generals disagree so much with Netanyahu, and the reason I wrote this book, was because I thought it was kind of paradoxical that, on the one hand, Benjamin Netanyahu is, has been known over the years as Mr. Security, quote unquote. That's how much of the world has seen him, and certainly many Israelis uh, have seen him as such. Um, whereas uh, the security establishment has seen him as a bungler and uh, as somebody who's more of a liability, a security liability than an asset. I thought that was a very interesting uh, paradox to, to explore. Um, and uh, this is still all the more true today in the aftermath of the uh, October 7th uh, massacre that caught Israel off guard. Uh, you had some generals and uh, senior generals as well as uh, senior members of the intelligence community who've taken responsibility and have said that they share some of the blame for what happened and they are willing to launch internal investigations to find out what went wrong, where did the, where did the, what were the intelligence failures here and where did the IDF go wrong. Um, the one person who has yet to take any responsibility for what happened is Netanyahu, who seems to be uh, uh, trying to uh, survive politically and, and pinning the blame on everything uh, on, the, uh, on the security establishment. So this, there's, there's a long history here of vehement disagreement, and we can get into some of the policy disagreements later, uh, between the senior security uh, officials and Netanyahu. He sees them as, as rivals, political rivals in many respects. And, um, and I think that the events of the last year, both the democratic protests in Israel of 2023, the summer of 2023, as well as the uh, October 7th uh, massacre, uh, has pretty much shattered uh, that myth that Netanyahu is as Mr. Secured. Thank you for that. I want to ask the first question to Professor Makdisi. Um, there have been arguments that Israel's destruction of Gaza is creating a vengeance cycle whereby the IDF's actions will incite a new generation of hatred towards Israel. And on the flip side of that, some argue that if Israel does not risk civilian collateral, Hamas will be incentivized to continue using civilians as shields. So how should Israel approach its counteroffensive with these considerations in mind? Well, I mean, first of all, the way you're framing the question is uh, deeply problematic, um, the words you're using and the phrasing itself. But let me go back to, since you asked three questions and three of us <laughs> gave answers, and then my co-panelist gave, um, inter before he answered your question, he talked about October 7th, <clears throat> without actually referring to what Khaled said, when Khaled said 27,000 Palestinians, at least 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, including over 10,000, including a mass starvation event happening before our eyes, including an international court of justice finding that there's plausible evidence of genocide, including all the things that everyone can see on social media and don't have the decency to even say that it's actually horrific what is happening, a genocide is occurring. You can say, I don't want to call it a genocide, call it whatever you want. We know that over 10,000 Palestinian children have been killed and it requires this basic honesty and decency for us to say this is unacceptable. In terms of your question, um, in terms of your question about what should happen and what should happen, the issue, of course, I'm a historian, mm -hmm. and the issue ultimately is about why and where did we get to the situation of October 7th and all the horrors of October 7th, and what's happened after October 7th, which is just beyond anyone's imagination. So let's try to avoid words like collateral. These are really dehumanizing words because we're talking about people on the ground, ultimately. And the question is, Israel occupied 
or uh, maybe I'll ask the audience, Hamas was founded in 1987. You, you guys are Dartmouth Political <laughs> Union, I think. You should know that. Hamas was founded in 1987. The Israeli occupation of Gaza began when? 1967. The Nakba was 1948. The Balfour Declaration was 1917. In other words, you have to have history and context to be able to understand why what is happening today is happening. Again, you don't have to agree or disagree. You have to go do your own reading. Each of you has to do your own reading. But the ultimate question is, can there be, ultimately, peace and justice, and especially justice, and you asked about this earlier, and equality between all peoples, between the river and the sea, Muslims, Christians, and Jews, can you have equality, and what is the form of that equality? That is the question. I'm not interested in what Israel does to respond or doesn't, because I can see what Israel is doing. Israel, as a state, has been absolutely explicit about its intentions. They don't hide the kind of the, the demolition that's going on in Gaza. It's unconscionable. As a human being, I find it unconscionable what is happening. And as a historian, I say we need context. You need context. You need history. You need to understand what is going on. You need to read and educate yourselves. Don't take my word for it, and don't take any of the panelists' words for it. Go read and read a variety of sources to figure out the way forward. That's what I would say. Thank you. Um, Professor Ziv, would you like to take that question, too, in terms of Israel is obviously um, dealing with dueling narratives here. Um, I know you just responded to. Um, how would how should Israel continue uh, with those considerations that I mentioned? In reference to the, to the ongoing war? Yes. Well, look, I, I support a ceasefire too, but maybe not on the same terms that, uh, that some of my panelists support the ceasefire. I think that- what, what, what terms would you have? Well, I think Hamas needs to release the hostages. I mean, these are innocent people who've been held there for, uh, for hundreds of days. Mm -hmm. And I think there needs to be uh, an exit strategy for Hamas. I think there's no way to, to have a terrorist group <clears throat> next door uh, to, to Israel. Uh, so uh, as long as Hamas continues to rule the Gaza Strip, using uh, schools and hospitals and ordinary people, you may not like this answer, but they're using them as human shields. Well, it's propaganda. I think, I it's, think not, it's not the answer. It's, it's propaganda. It is the you're, you're, you're supposed it is to be the answer. scholar. <laughs> you we'll we'll you go, found it yesterday. Well, we'll go one at a time. We'll go one at a time. So I think under the right terms, I absolutely support uh, a ceasefire. I also support humanitarian pause that would allow for greater uh, humanitarian uh, services and goods to enter the Strip, both through Egypt and through Israel. Uh, but I think if we had a terrorist organization next door, I think we'd all be saying the same thing. Uh, and, and Hamas is making very clear its intentions. They're not hiding its intentions. All right. Um, Director Elgindi, I want to bring you into this um, with your experience in the negotiations. Palestinians in the state of Israel have engaged in a series of negotiations over the past few decades. Um, scholars have argued that the Oslo Accords of the 90s between the PLO and Israel failed to memorialize Palestinian statehood, and they actually increased tension um, and violence between Israelis and Palestinians. Do you agree with this characterization? Um, and what are the greatest barriers? I mean, I think we're seeing two of the, the op opposing sides over here. So what are the greatest barriers to coming to terms and actually being able to negotiate with one another? OK. Um, just to continue the tradition, I have to respond to some of the things that, <laughs> Go for that have it. been said, because, because it actually relates to this question. Yep. Um, so I think everybody can agree October 7th was uh, a, a horrific day full of atrocities that killed 1,200 some whatever, I don't know the exact number, 1,139, uh, mostly civilians. <coughs> you don't have to be Jewish or Israeli to feel empathy for the victims of that day. There's no question that, it, that Israelis <coughs> suffered a major collective trauma in addition to the, the trauma that was visited on the individuals and families on that day. Um, but what Israel has visited on Palestinians in Gaza is orders of magnitude greater in its horror and terror than what happened on October 7th. And I'm sorry, quantitatively, it is far greater. The level of destruction in Gaza has been destroyed. Gaza as a society, as a place for humans to inhabit, has been 
destroyed, okay? That's in addition to the 30,000 who've been killed and 11,000 children. What Israel has visited upon Gaza is unconscionable, indefensible, morally, politically, diplomatically, militarily, any which way. It's impossible to imagine, even if you set aside the human component, we don't have any empathy, we don't care about human beings. If you just think of it rationally, how can anyone imagine that the complete destruction of Gaza, 70% of the homes in Gaza have been destroyed or damaged. 90% of the population has been uprooted. How does anyone imagine that that level of destruction, death, and suffering is going to bring security to anyone, much less their neighbors in Israel? The fact that people can disagree, people can say, doesn't meet the threshold of genocide, the fact that we're talking about genocide at all, the fact that it went to the International Court of Justice and they found a, a plausible basis that genocide could possibly be happening. Whether or not they find genocide doesn't matter. The fact that we're even in the realm talking about genocide should have been a wake-up call, but instead it hasn't. And we're talking about collateral damage and we're talking about fighting terrorism. There are things more evil than terrorism. I think genocide is more evil than terrorism. Um, but it's not a competition, right? Because one side's trauma and death and suffering doesn't justify uh, the other. So going back to the question of what are the conditions that will lead to peace? Not this, OK? You cannot bring peace with war and destruction and death. That's it's, it's, it's illogical, it's nonsensical. And yet this is how our politicians talk, right? Once Hamas is eliminated, I promise you Hamas won't be eliminated. They will always be in Gaza. They will be stronger politically than they were on October 6th, even if they're weaker militarily. Um, they will exist in East Jerusalem, they will exist in the West Bank, they will exist in the diaspora because it's a political movement that you don't destroy with bombs. Um, you don't destroy ideas with bombs. You destroy them with better ideas and better outcomes. Why does Hamas exist? Hamas exists as an armed group because there's an occupation. What is occupation? It is a form of systemic violence, right? It is institutionalized, regularized systemic violence that when you, in order to maintain it, you need to consistently ratchet up to the, the level of repression, which is violence. That's how you get a group like Hamas that says the only way to respond to the violence of the occupation is through, through more violence. That's how you perpetuate conflict. That's how conflicts, right? The opposite of conflict is conflict resolution. Not arming, you know, bypassing Congress in order to send two, more 2,000 pound bombs to, to destroy entire neighborhoods of Gaza. That's not diplomacy and conflict resolution, right? I mean, it's logical. If you want, to, if you want conflict to stop, you, you address the root causes. What we are doing now, what the United States is doing, is not only supporting the, the very causes that perpetuate violence, we have now extended it into future generations. The, 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 this moment, what the destruction of Gaza is for Palestinians equivalent to 1967 and 1948. So now we've added a whole new layer of trauma and, and generational uh, conflict, or uh, uh, you know, we've added another layer of conflict that will last generations. That's to me not only morally wrong, but also fundamentally irrational. Professor Fish, I want to bring you into the conversation here. Uh, we just heard that uh, what's going on is, you know, uh, settler colonialism. Uh, I assume you would take the opposite stance of that uh, on the establishment of Israel uh, as a settler colonial state. Um, why is what happened uh, when the UN said that Israel could be established in the Palestinian territory at the time, why is that not settler colonialism? Colonialism, sorry. So in the same vein, I'll respond <laughs> to a few things before answering the question. I think it's really, really important to understand that millions and millions of dollars 
from the EU, from the United Nations, from the United States has gone into Gaza, right? <coughs> A lot. That money wasn't used for Palestinians. I know I'm upsetting you. No, you're free to speak, please. Right? Like, it wasn't. Sure it was. It was used to build tunnels. It was, was used it? to totally stockpile true. lots of weapons, which they did, hid them underneath the hospitals. <coughs> United Nations employees from the Relief and Works Agency, the only UN agency that's to deal with only Palestinian refugees when we know there are refugee situations, and also has changed the definition of a refugee because it extends <coughs> for multiple generations. That UN agency itself the other day was very clear. We have a problem. We're corrupt. We've got real rot in our institution in which we have employees from the UN and from this agency who are supposed to be building peace and sustainable relations between Israelis, Palestinians, and creating a better life for Palestinians, which they haven't, have clearly been involved in the attacks on October 7th. This is very real. When we look at the numbers that have been quoted, I would ask us from where do those numbers come, not because I'm interested in a conversation about X number of civilians or Y number of civilians, but I do not trust an institution called Hamas, which is a terrorist organization, to report in an accountable and transparent way the number of individuals who have died. I would also ask in your thousands that you have mentioned how many of them are Hamas terrorists. We Why haven't made a distinction. Well, we know it's over 10,000. And we haven't made a distinction oh. between Hamas terrorists and Palestinians. Jesus. The Palestinians who truly are under the complete control of a dictatorial terrorist organization. I would also ask why Egypt hasn't said come in. Meaning this cannot be understood only in the context of October 7th, and it cannot be understood only in the context of specifically Israel's response to mass terrorism. Mass terrorism, which is based on a charter that is radically Islamist and extremist. It is an anti-Semitic doctrine. Read it. Nothing about it is about building sustainable peace and justice between two peoples. You can easily find it online. So, these are really serious parts of the equation that have been neglected from this conversation. And you all as critical thinkers need to be able to ask those questions. Why are they being marginalized? They are important components of the discussion. In terms of the question specifically related to colonialist settler, I think where I would start with that conversation is that if we were in a classroom and we had 13 weeks to teach about Zionism and to have a real intellectual discourse about understanding what colonialism means, what colonization means, what colonialist settler looks like, and how there are a variety of cases in the context of nationalist movements, we can have that conversation. What I want to say is that the way in which the colonialist settler framework is thrusted into the Israel conversation is for a clear ideological agenda to suggest that Israel was created in sin. No nation state is created in immaculate conception. Nobody here could name one of them. But to suggest that Israel is created in order to be able to be powerful and displace an indigenous and authentic native peoples has a particular agenda associated with it. And we have to unpack that agenda. Now, after the events of 1967, there is a real conversation to be had about what does it mean for Israel to control territories that it newly acquired in a preemptive strike in the 1967 war, meaning specifically the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, or Gaza Strip. Those two specifically in this case. And that's a real conversation, and it's a real conversation that Israelis are having on a regular basis about what does it mean for Israel to maintain a presence in the West Bank? It has no presence in Gaza since 2005. Unilateral withdrawal by Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, formerly right of center, became a little bit, not, a little bit more centrist, but not too far centrist. 
So I just want to say, like, these terms matter, and if they're just thrown out there, genocide, ethnic cleansing, colonialist settler, these are terms that are used to evoke an emotional response in order to suggest that Jews have no right to self-determination, and I don't subscribe to the position. I, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to bring you in, but I'm also going to ask you to respond to uh, the idea of the actual establishment of Israel as a settler, settler colonist project, but also um, I want to move into a conversation of disentangling anti-Zionism from anti-Semitism, which I assume that you would do, um, and then I'll bring in Professor Ziv on that conversation as well. The first thing I would say, of course, the term is settler colonialism, not colonial settler. But that's an important distinction, which, which tells me that you may not be aware of the literature, which is an academic literature, on the topic. And you can go read it. And you, again, like Let's in any the academic conversation thing, you, on the yeah, topic. Yeah, you can, you can figure out. You can go read. Or you can read any number of scholars who have written on the topic of settler colonialism about Australia, about South Africa, about New Zealand, about the United States, America, Canada, and so on, and Israel, of course. Uh, you can go read and you make up your own minds about this term. But it's important to actually understand that it's a scholarly debate. Um, what I find astonishing in, this, in, in the litany that I just heard is the fact that there's not even an ability to acknowledge the fact. There's denial. Your, your, your point, rather than, saying, rather than acknowledging Khaled's point and the point of saying that over 10,000 children have been killed, have been slaughtered, there's a mass starvation event, event taking place right now. Nobody in the world denies it. And all you can do is repeat Israeli talking points. Rather than just say, look, there's actually something going on now. Don't, you don't want to call it a genocide. You're free. Forget the International Court of Justice. But there is a horror going on on the ground. The least you can do as a person is to say, look, this is reprehensible. Let's understand why these things are happening, if you want to justify it. But my point is, at least be honest and be a scholar. Try not to repeat and insult my intelligence and other people's intelligence by bringing in talking points. And let's talk about the history. The reason why people say settler colonialism is very simple. Again, you haven't answered the question. Where did Zionism emerge? Did Zionism emerge among the indigenous Jewish communities, which of course existed in the Middle East? It's a European Thank discussion. You. Thank you. It emerged. Also, well, 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 if you ask me, I get to answer it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You said hold Europe. Hold yeah. Thank oh you. my God, oh. Europe. <gasps> so right, let right, me ask you. So the point is, in answer to European anti-Semitism, right? Anti-Semitism and assimilation. There are two okay. questions that are being asked by Zionists exactly. and Jews. Let me, let me finish. I, again, the point is that it's answering European questions, whether it's anti-Semitism or the question of assimilation. Right, but was nationalism part of Wait, the Arab I, movement at this time? What, what, are, you, not, what are you talking was, about? Which was time? Arab nationalism in the 19th century Do you know all the, the same conversation as what many peoples, not just Jews, Many people were having wait, let, in let the me, context if I may, of the dissolving if I may, of the empire. Okay. I'm just going to step I, in here after yeah. this question that was asked. You yeah. can finish your. Yeah, let me finish my point. And then so my we'll point get is get others to jump the in. Reason, the reason, the point why people say so, just to explain to the students here, the reason why people use the term settler colonialism is because Zionism emerged as a European ideology to answer European questions, to answer the question of European anti Semitism and the question of how to get. How, where, where do Jews belong in Europe? And so, of course, there were people who assimilated. There were others who said, it's not going to work. We need to leave and create a state of our own. Where did they choose the state? They chose it in Palestine after 1897. The problem, of course, is that Palestine was already inhabited by Palestinians. And yet, the entire project, when it came to the Balfour Declaration of 1917, when the British Empire basically embraced Zionism, and set up a mandate, the government of Palestine, in 1920 onwards, it basically forced the Zionist project on the native population. Because the problem that the Zionists recognized, the early Zionists all recognized, almost all coming from Europe, the leadership, they recognized that they could not build a Jewish state in a land that was overwhelmingly inhabited by Palestinians, who were overwhelmingly Muslim and Christian. Do you understand? That was the, and so then, eventually, they resolved this problem, quote unquote, in the Nakba of 1948 by ethnically cleansing the Palestinians and creating the state of Israel in 1948. Again, go read Israeli historians and go read Palestinian historians. Make up your own minds. What was your other question? I'm sorry, I forgot. I was asking about disentangling what I would, I would think that you would do is anti-Zionism from anti-Semitism. Well, obviously, I mean, the, the question of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, the question also is, 
for the, if you think about Zionism, there are many forms of Zionism in the 19th century. Cultural Zionism, linguistic Zionism, spiritual Zionism, and political Zionism. When it comes to Palestine as a project, as a political project to be imposed on the native population, whether the native population likes it or doesn't like it, which is what happened, beginning with the British mandate, going all the way to 1940 and all the way till today. When that happened, it became a colonial project. So from the perspective of Palestinians, who are the native indigenous population, who resist this colonial project, of course they're going to resist it, and they call it anti-Zionism. They call it also Palestinian liberation. They're anti-Zionist in the same way people are anti-racist, the same way they're anti-colonialist in Africa, in Asia, in the Americas, and so on. Of course, that is not an inherently anti-Semitic. Does that mean that there aren't people? Of course there are people in the world who are anti-Semitic, but the real issue is what is the vision for justice? What is the vision for equality? We go back to this fundamental point that no advocate of Israel, as far as here, because there, there, there are some brilliant Israeli individuals who are brave and who are honest and who tell the truth, Ilan Pape, among others. There are these individuals. <laughs> She laughs. I, mean, I do. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, that's your issue. You're free to laugh. But the point is, there are. Go read. Go read. Don't listen to. Don't don't listen to people who laugh. Go read it for yourselves and see. The bottom line of all this is that, of course, anti-Zionism at its core, it's anti-colonialism is what it is, first and foremost, because Zionism became a colonial project when it was imposed in Palestine against the Palestinians, and when it dispossessed the Palestinians. Because the question is, by what right? Does one create an ethno-religious national state in a multi-religious land? And how do you guarantee equality for all peoples, for every single individual, whether they're Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, between the river and the sea? How do you do that short of a secular state, a secular democratic state, or maybe two secular democratic states, or maybe 10 secular? It doesn't really matter how many states. The question is, how do you do it short of actual equality? Secular equality, so it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or Muslim or Christian. And that's a question that Zionists cannot ever answer because they're wedded to the idea of an ethno-religious nationalist state in Palestine and they, 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 they don't want to admit that there's a fundamental problem. What about the Palestinians? Where do they belong? How do you get equality and justice? For all peoples, remember, we're saying for all peoples, for Muslims, for Christians, and for Jews, for all peoples. How do you do that short of a secular state? Professor Ziv, I want to bring you into this. Um, in disentangling anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, uh, the connection between the two of them maybe, would you like to respond? Sure. Well, first of all, I have to take exception to your uh, suggestion that uh, the students avoid reading People Who Laugh. I think uh, you should all read People Read everyone. To, yeah, I agree. Read everybody, read everyone. including yeah, we, people who are... We agree. Okay. Read everything. Uh, let's talk about Zionism and anti-Zionism. I think part of the problem of this discourse is that we, uh, and, you know, th there are some nice buzzwords here about uh, settler colonialism and uh, some of the other buzzwords we've, we've heard here that are really questioning the legitimacy of Israel. And when we're talking about October 7th, and its aftermath, which I think is the, is the topic that uh, we're here to discuss, we need to look a little bit further and ask ourselves what's next. So whether there is a ceasefire, no ceasefire, what's going to happen after this war? And I, I can't speak on behalf of my fellow panelists, but I'd like to think we all would like this war to end sooner rather than later. Um, the question is what's next? And here we go to Hamas's popularity. And unfortunately, I think you're right. I think uh, you cannot destroy an idea. And Hamas is not going to be dismantled. And I say that with regret, because I think that it is a terrorist organization uh, that is bent on Israel's destruction. And that shouldn't be there uh, and should not be in power. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that Israel has made uh, and this is a mistake at both the political level as well as the intelligence level, is underestimating Hamas's ability and willingness to uh, commit the crimes that they did on, on October uh, 7th. The assumption all along was that Israel, was that Hamas, as the governing power in Gaza, would put its people first 
would take that money that we talked about and build something, construct something. Sharon, who built uh, more settlements than any other politician, uh, who became prime minister, took the very painful step for him, uh, and politically painful as well, I might add, of withdrawing unilaterally from the Gaza Strip. Okay, not leaving a single settler and not leaving a single soldier. And the communities in southern Israel, uh, people your age, have grown up their entire lives with rockets uh, shelling their villages, their uh, towns, their cities, their kibbutzim, and their area. Um, so uh, Hamas took over in a coup uh, in 2007. And, uh, and so, yes, Israel imposed an embargo because they did not want those supplies to be used for weaponry. But it did not, in its wildest imagination, Israelis did not, in their wildest imagination, uh, think that something like this would happen. They knew that they were building tunnels, but they underestimated uh, the number of tunnels, the number of shafts that go into the tunnels. Uh, they thought that there would be something to the tune of 250 miles was the estimate even a few months ago. Now with the, uh, with the war, there seems to be what's going on here, implausible. It's being fixed. Okay. <laughs> uh, it is implausible. Um, the, uh, the estimates now are uh, closer to 400 miles. We're talking about what Israelis call a metro system in the, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and instead of using all those funds that they received uh, through Qatar and other international uh, uh, organizations, uh, instead of building a country, building a state, uh, they built uh, terror infrastructure. Some of these tunnels can, are big enough for cars to go through. Uh, they're as long, some of them are as long as three football fields. Uh, and we're talking about thousands of shafts that are under mosques, schools, people's homes. Okay, so yes. They are absolutely using people as human shields. But the most important point here is not just that Hamas thinks of this as resistance. It's not that Hamas thinks of this as a resistance to Israeli occupation. It's how it defines Israeli occupation. And this ties into this whole question about Israel's legitimacy because their definition of occupation is not Israel's uh, uh, victory in 1967 and taking over the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Their, their version of the occupation is the very existence, the very essence of Israel, which in their mind should not exist. I think that's actually a very important distinction here uh, because I happen to oppose the occupation too. And many Israelis I know oppose the occupation. And many members of Congress who support Israel oppose the occupation. But, they, but, they, but, but these people who, support the, that, who oppose the occupation and, and want to see a Palestinian state, want to see a Palestinian state live side by side in peace with Israel, not replace Israel. So at this point, I mean, I could have spent this time talking about the fact that the Zionist, uh, the, the Zionist project had many supporters, and it wasn't just Europe, and it wasn't just European Jews. Um, there's a reason that the UN uh, 10 years, 11 years after the British partition plan came up with its own partition plan. And it was composed of uh, many different uh, uh, member states that reached the same conclusion, which was the only way that these two people can live together, inhabit this land, is by dividing it, is partitioning the land into two states. Um, and, uh, and so, th there's, and the UN voted so in favor of Israel and so it was a UN vote that established the State of Israel. And, 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 and the last thing I want to say. Are you addressing me or addressing somebody else? He's addressing me. Oh, he's addressing you. Okay. I'm, so I'm addressing him. Yeah. yeah. All right. uh, the last thing I wanted to say here is I could have also talked about the fact that there's been Jewish presence there from time immemorial. Uh, it's not like there were not Jews there before the Zionists uh, began to, uh, to bring uh, immigrants uh, from Eastern Europe there. So th there's a lot we can unpack here, but, but to me, the, the biggest Point, the most important point is, what do we do about the fact that Israel is there, whether you like it or not? Okay? Are we going to argue about its legitimacy forever? Or are we going to recognize that there's a state there? Let's create another state. Let's create a Palestinian state. Let's give them the same rights and the same sovereignty that Israelis would like to enjoy. 
Unfortunately, I'm out of time as the moderator, but we're gonna move to audience Q&A and I'd like you guys to address kind of where we go from here uh, through the audience Q&A. Uh, but the audience, if you wanna line up in the aisle over here, we're gonna have one of the DPU's <coughs> ambassadors hold a microphone. Um, and I just ask that you let them hold the microphone. What's that? I've been making a list of all the things I wanted to respond. I would like to address my question to Professor McDesey and Professor Elgindi. Um, if you're advising a state, let's just hypothetical, that has just lost a thousand of its citizens, many of them children, and not just killed in battle, but with the kind of viciousness, the kind of sadistic, incredible viciousness, and nobody even mentioned violence against women, which was incredible. The only parallel I can think of of that kind of viciousness is, is, is behavior of Nazis during World War II. What would you advise that government, since you're saying that going to Gaza by Israel was a mistake? Should Israel have said, sorry, we're not gonna do anything, it's a liberation movement, they have every right to do this, and we're just gonna sit back and watch this blood flowing. I'm just curious, what, how would you, what would you suggest they should do? So Israel gets attacked, what should their response reasonably be? I get this question all the time. Um, it's, First of all, from a, from a technical legal standpoint, Israel doesn't have the right of self-defense if the threat is coming from territory that it occupies. Self-defense has to do with you're attacked by another state. You have the right to defend yourself as a state. But if you are the occupier, you are already, you have, over, you have overriding security responsibility for both your population and the occupied population. So self-defense in the strict legal sense doesn't apply. But let's just set that aside. Israel clearly had to respond to an attack on its citizens. Um, the, what, what could have happened is a more targeted attack on Hamas, on Hamas's uh, weapons, on Hamas's tunnels, but it would have required something other than carpet bombing Gaza. Right? It would have required going in on the ground and focusing on ground operations, special operations, those kinds of things in which Israeli soldiers take on greater risk. Right? So the calculation of Israeli military and political leaders was to, to minimize our risk, we're going to bomb Gaza. We're going to destroy civilian infrastructure, which is a war crime. We're going to deny food and water and medicine, which is a, a war crime. So we're going to do all of these things to minimize our risk and, in the process, maximize the risk to, to Palestinian civilians. So if the only thing that we can think of is a response is bomb and kill everything and starve people, well, I'm sorry. That, then that's, it's not as if it's either I have no right to defend myself or I have to commit genocide. I mean, there's a whole lot of options in between that don't involve the in complete annihilation of Gaza. So I'm sorry, it's not a, it's not a question, like I, I'm sure military experts, you can bring them and say, what would a targeted response be to what happened on October 7th? But what Israel has done is not a targeted response. This isn't collateral damage. They are deliberately destroying apartment buildings. They are gleefully blowing up universities. Have you seen the TikTok videos? They are broadcasting their own war crimes with no self-awareness at all. Have you seen the videos of the soldiers happily blowing up people's homes, mocking the, home, the, the, the people whom, who, who they've killed? I mean, it's, it, it, this is the kind of psychology that, that leads to the kinds of war crimes that we're seeing on a massive, massive scale. So there has to be an, something short of that that is, that is acceptable. It's clear what Israel is doing is not self-defense, but retribution and revenge and rage and, and acting out their own humiliation. Israel's military leaders were humiliated on October 7th. 
How do you respond to that in a measured, deliberate way? No, they responded by exacting retribution. And they told us they would. They told us we are going to flatten Gaza. Gaza will become a city of tents. We are going to, it will become a deserted island. They told us exactly what they intended to do, and then they did it. So we can't be surprised or be in denial. No, no, they didn't do those things. They told us they were going to do exactly what they did. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that Khalid said. I mean, it's sort of open and should go again, go, go, go read the history. And everything Khalid said is absolutely correct. And the question is also, what was Gaza before October 7th? Because history does not begin on October 7th. And any, any scholar here should be able to tell you that honestly. History did not start on October 7th. Gaza, you said, was under blockade. It's not just a blockade. It was under a siege for, for my, the entire life of my daughter. Gaza has been, who's 17, Gaza has been under siege long before October 7th. Israel controlled the airspace. Israel controlled the, the sea access. Israel controlled all the borders except Rafah. And even Rafah, goods are not allowed in without Israeli checking. So the idea of saying, why do, and look at the, the prevarication, the denialism. The amazing thing is how much denialism I've heard by two of my colleagues, two of my panelists here, who can't acknowledge, who simply can't even acknowledge the extraordinary imbalance of power, the colonization. They just keep telling you Gaza and human shields and this, rather than actually telling you, go study, go read about Gaza. Again, don't take our words for it. Go read about Gaza. Go read Sarah Roy. Go read international jurists. Go find out for yourselves what the situation of Gaza was like before October 7th, let alone now, where it's been pulverized before your very eyes on every single social media platform. So the gentleman who asked that question, what should Israel do? I mean, has it ever occurred to you to reverse the question a little bit and say, well, Palestinians have been under Israeli violence and colonialism for decades. Does that justify October 7th? You're going to see, presumably, no, right? And you think it, it, no, it, what, I'm saying, what, I, what I'm saying to you precisely is what I'm saying to you is understand that you're saying, well, in response to October 7th, the Israelis should be able to do everything they did. And the answer we're giving you is understand, first of all, the history and the context. And second of all, understand that the Palestinians could use that same logic that you're using. In fact, Hamas uses that same exact logic that you're using, saying, we are representing an aggrieved and suffered and colonized people. Does that mean they're right? Does that mean they didn't commit war crimes? They did commit war crimes. And the people who committed war crimes should be tried. But of course, the genocidal Israel, what Israel has done is a genocide, and everyone can see that. Go look at the International Court of Justice. Do not take our words. I say to you as students, forget the older people. Go with the students. Go read. And above all, go see the, see, listen to the Israelis if you want in the International Court of Justice, their presentation, listen to South Africa's. Be objective and then you make up your own minds. Next question. Hi, uh, first of all, thanks so much for coming here. Uh, I've been reading history on uh, Palestine and Gaza issue, uh, the Israel and Palestinian issue. I've also looked into a lot of books and current events, but I learned one thing. As a victim of uh, war for myself, I mourned the loss of human lives on October 7, and I mourn the continued loss of Palestinian lives since October 7. Uh, no human life is more or less than other human lives, and we do not need a college degree or a nice suit to understand or acknowledge this fact. My first question is Professor, from Professor uh, Fish, and see if either one can answer. Reflecting on the previous wars, mainly the US wars against insurgency, for instance, in Iraq, which resulted in development of ISIS, and in Afghanistan, where a final deal was concluded with the same group they fought for, for 20 years. Is the current strategy to eliminate Hamas successful, or is it helping Hamas and in formation of similar groups? Considering the people filled with grievances and the number of civilian victims in Gaza, is war the only option? My second question and a follow-up is Professor Khalid and Professor Osama. Is it too soon or too late for the US and Biden administration to adopt a different attitude towards Netanyahu government in the war? considering the October 7 attack and the number of civilian victims in Gaza. Again, is war the only option? Thank you so much. I'll just answer very Please, quickly. Yeah, no, I'm happy to have Very you. quickly, thank you for the question and the preamble before, because I agree with you fully around human life. Um, I, I agree with what Khaled said earlier about um, Hamas being emboldened and what you said, yeah, Guy. I really I do that well. feel that that's a real issue yeah. in terms of this current conflict. 
Um, we know from polling from Khalil Shakaki from Bir Zaid University. He also is at Brandeis and he runs his own Palestinian Survey Research Center in Ramallah that in the West Bank, not in Gaza, that there is increasing support of Hamas amongst Palestinians. Part of that, and we know this, is because of Fatah and its perception and what it hasn't done for Palestinians in the West Bank and Mahmoud Abbas, et cetera. But Israel is very concerned about being sandwiched between Hamasistan and you know, a West Bank with Hamas. That's a problem. It's a real problem for Israel. But I would just add to this equation, and we haven't talked about it at all, the role of Iran. Iran is a regional actor that is absolutely supporting the actions of Hamas and Hezbollah, which we haven't talked about either, which will be another front that Israel will have to engage with. And the role of Iran, the role of Russia, because this is a regional conflict. It is not just between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. It is much bigger than that. And we need to understand the influence, once again, of radical Islamism and the way in which it is absolutely emboldening political actors who are extremists, who, I agree with Guy, ultimately are interested in the demise and illegitimacy. Their perception is that Israel as a Jewish state is illegitimate. And it doesn't matter if it's a one state of all its citizens or if it's a Jewish and democratic state as the forefathers and foremothers aspired in the Declaration of Independence built on Palestinian land. But I'll leave that aside for a second. Well, it's like you forgetting yeah. that all Jews in Europe were being persecuted in I the said, 18th, 19th century I and needed a safe haven and a refuge well, for the yeah. Jewish people. You, you, you deliberately so missed there's right. a piece of that that was you, forgotten you're, you're as just, well. You were just repeating Israeli... Zonky. I love okay. how we're repeating right. Israeli. Right. Yes. Just one second. If Israeli he talk, talk, hold on, hold on, hold on You keep repeating these talking points. Well, then you're repeating Hamas talking points. All right, there you go. What would you like me to tell you? All right, Well, so clearly there's disagreement. That's All right, let's not level a test. That is very patronizing. All right, I'm actually... I'm actually, I mean, guys, honestly, can we stop? Can we have a respectful yeah. academic yeah, sure. discussion here? Sure. If you're all academics, I think we should be here for, sure. for one yeah, but he's quick ideal. To throw the... Sure, we're all here to engage with different perspectives, and let's go to the next audience. Can I just part. add one yeah. line, though, to, to Rachel? Quickly, comments. please. Uh, so, so I agree with, with, uh, with, with what you said. I would, I would also add that when it comes to Hamas, uh, Hamas is the genocidal actor here. Oh my God! Uh, this is incredible. See, <laughs> I mean, do you have an international let him, court let him of make justice? His point, let yeah. him make yeah. his point, and then you can please respond. Make your point. Can't do it. Yeah. Well, of course I can. Can, can we just uh -huh. stay away from the attacks and you know, we're let it? We're supposed to be role models please. here for students. <laughs> well, all right. Can yeah. we? Everyone, just stop. So, speak your own statement, and then other people can respond. That's enough. how so, academia is supposed to work. So Hamas is a genocidal actor, which means that uh, there there is really only a military solution when it comes to Hamas. But more importantly. There is no military solution to this conflict with the Palestinians. And this is, I think, the part that's been missing. Uh, there, and this is where President Biden, I think, comes in. Because uh, like him, don't like him, you can criticize uh, some of his actions and some of his statements, or lack thereof. But the one thing he has done that neither the Palestinians nor the Israelis have done is raise the question of what's next. What is going to happen after uh, this war. Netanyahu refused to talk, to talk about it, and the Palestinian leaders refused to talk about it. And I think that having a uh, political and diplomatic horizon is essential. Um, and it's, and, and, and two, the two-state solution is it. Um, is it popular right now? No. Is it going to happen right away? Definitely not. But there needs to be a political solution not just a military action against Hamas. Do you can want I, to jump in on this Can I have 30 point? seconds? Can yeah. I have 30 seconds? To just, just on that point. So, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to, to Guy's point, the, you completely contradicted yourself. How do, you, how do you say there's a military solution to Hamas, but there's no military solution to this conflict? It, it's as if Hamas is not a part of this conflict. So what's happening right now? Um, the, the correct answer, so you're half right, the correct answer is there is no military solution to this conflict. There is a political solution to this conflict. A responsible international actor like the United States should act responsibly by asserting that instead of fueling 
the, the military uh, uh, conflict and, and adding now new levels and a, a generation of additional conflict. That's completely illogical, but also reckless. This uh, Biden administration's approach has been not only inhumane, but disastrously reckless and dangerous because it is sowing the seeds of, of, of forces that will be far worse than Hamas. Hamas is, has political goals. You can, you, can, you can identify them. Anyway, I said I would take 30 seconds. I took more, so I'll shut up. Yeah, I mean, to, 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 again, echoing everything Khaled said, I don't have much to add except to say that the job of scholars in this room is not to be representatives of the state of Israel or anyone else. They are to actually be scholars. And ultimately, honestly, the question is, all I'm asking, especially of some of the colleagues here, is, and the students especially, try not to invoke denialism. Try not to go into denialism. Open your minds to history. Read, as I've said from the beginning, read Israeli sources, read Palestinian sources. Try to just do that. That's all I'm asking you. Go read the International Court of Justice, the entirety of the case, and make up your own minds. But the most important thing, what you've seen in this panel here, is an extraordinary amount of justification of genocide on the one hand and denialism on the other. There's no recognition of the fact that ultimately we're talking about how do you build a society between the river to the sea based on equality? How do you do that and hold on to this idea of a state for one group, only one group, even though the idea, and you've acknowledged that the idea came from Europe and was imposed on Palestine and the Palestinians. So the Palestinians are saying today, overwhelmingly, they don't even have a choice because they're under occupation, they're under siege, they're in East Jerusalem as residents but not citizens, There's an, and of course there are many in exile, millions in exile. The question is how do you get equality? Grapple with that as students. These should be the questions. Not are we gonna solve, because we're not gonna solve anything, but you have an obligation as students, honestly, as scholars, as human beings, to be ethical and to be honest and to try not to wrap yourself in denial. To go read the history, make up your own minds. So, so I just have one important historical piece. Please. Right. 1937 Peel Commission. You don't even know. Have you read? Go read the Peel Commission. I urge you to go yeah, read, read the Peel, the Peel Com Commission. And read what the, do you know, have you read the Peel Commission? All right. Can we, so let, all right. Let me, let me, let, since she brought up the Peel Commission, may I? Because I also, hold on, hold on, hold on, I, I, hold on. I teach the Peel Commission, but I'm happy to tell you, go read Professor the Peel Commission. Professor Mark all right, read Please. the Peel Commission for yourself, yeah. but we're going to continue. Yeah. One yeah. last question. One last question here. You can read the Peel Commission on your own time. Personally, I prefer the white paper, which came a little bit after the Peel Commission. But I have a, a question kind of based on a quote a little bit. So there's this famous Jewish intellectual who I really like. His name's Albert Einstein. He said, um, <laughs> the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Yep. I'm just confused why people are so hung up on the two-state solution, given that quote, if it just hasn't worked so far. Like, from me, from an outside perspective, it would seem that maybe it's time to think about other horizons to, to solve you know, what's going on. So to what extent are potentially one state solutions or other imaginations relevant now seeing as a two state solution has failed for like 75 years? Can, Unfortunately, can I say one quick, oh, yeah. so this has to be the last audience question just given timing, but if, what is the solution now? Is it a two state solution? Is it binationalism? Is it, what yeah, is it? So, so I just wanna say very quickly because my entire doctoral work was on binationalism and this idea of one state, two peoples. So despite what he believes, I actually know these documents inside and out. And Zionist theoreticians, there were many of them who were asking that question. And some of them were talking about confederacy and consociationalism. And they were looking to Belgium and other places to see, are these models? So your point is well taken in that there are different ideas. And the British really thought, look, two states, Jewish and Arab, they didn't fully understand for sure what was happening. And that has been the working paradigm. But the question you're asking, I think, is a very serious and real question in terms of the future of this place. Is that feasible today, given the realities, both the challenges and also the identities that now exist there? But I'd love to hear, in a very practical way, you know, Khaled, how this is thought about. I mean, look, people have been at, you guys talked about the Peel Commission. We, people have been trying to have a two-state solution for like almost 100 years, and it, and it hasn't worked. And we've been do, trying to, and I would say Peel was not serious, and UN in 1947 also was not a serious two-state solution. It was a one-state solution disguised as, a, as partition. But the, the, the goal was never to create a Palestinian state. The goal in 1947 was to create a Jewish state. 
um, uh, and everybody sort of discarded that, that other part of the, you know, the create an Arab state. Um, and they were fine with that. But, but as a serious matter, for at least the last, most of the last 30 years, that has been the kind of international consensus. It's been tried, it's been failed. We've, we've had labor governments and centrist governments and Likud governments and far right and center left and we've had the whole range, the spectrum. We had Yasser Arafat, we had Mahmoud Abbas, we had even Hamas was elected in, in 2006. So we've, we've had Republicans and Democrats, we've tried every possible combination, it didn't work. And now you have 700,000 settlers, you have an, an, a, a right-wing Israeli society, never mind the body politic, um, that is so post two states, post Oslo, like it's not even funny. Um, you have now Jewish supremacists who were used to be in the margins of Israeli politics are front and center, right? They were, you know, the, the forebears of, of uh, Ben Gvir, uh, you know, were, they were, they were, Kahana was barred from, mm -hmm. uh, from being in the, in the Knesset. Now, the entire Israeli political spectrum has shifted, and I have to say, that rightward shift has also shifted American politics on this issue very far to the right. Um, and so now, I'm, I'm sorry to say, two-state solution is not, is not achievable anymore. It's not achievable politically, it's not achievable physically, it's not achievable economically. Who's going to pay for the at least two to 300,000 of the 700,000 settlers who have to be removed, even if you imagine there's some kind of land swap and you can get creative with the borders. And how do you, how do, you do, who's, like, who, who's gonna pay for that? And then how do you sell that to an Israeli public? Uprooting two, you know, a quarter million people. It's just not, it's not achievable. It's not, it's not doable. Um, I think the only thing that's possible now is how do you make the situation less awful based on principles of equality. Um, people can have their national narratives, they can have their national, like, you know, uh, Palestinians and, uh, Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews can live as neighbors in a place like Haifa, um, not so much in Jerusalem because of the inequality, because of the asymmetry, because of one group dominates another, but when you remove that domination, you find that they actually can live together. Because it's not about, I hate you because you're Jewish, I hate you because you're Arab. It's, I am, I am one group is dominant. One group is accustomed to, to domination and doesn't want to give up that privilege. And then another group completely loathes that domination and will do anything to, to end it. So I'm afraid I don't see a future for two states. I also don't see a future for one state at the moment because there's it's not politically viable. I don't see any political actor in any society that is, that is sort of the address for a one-state solution, right? I don't see a, a political party in Palestine. I don't see a, one in Israel. So who's rallying for the one state with equality? It hasn't been born yet. So two states is dead. One state hasn't been born. We're stuck in this uh, basically apartheid reality indefinitely. And it's deeply, deeply destabilizing as we're seeing right now. I'll bring you two in on this, Maybe and then unfortunately we have to close out. I, 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 I agree with everything Tyler said. I'm not going to add. I okay. totally so I'll just agree. add a few words here. I know, I know we're trying to wrap up. Uh, first, the, I've asked uh, many uh, uh, ex-generals what they think about this, uh, as well as former heads of Mossad, Mossad and, and Shin Bet uh, intelligence agencies when I was uh, in the process of writing my, my, new, my new book. And the vast majority believe that, this is a, uh, that the two-state solution is the only solution. Uh, and that uh, when I ask them, well, what about the argument that it's dead? What about the argument that there's so many settlements it would be impossible to create a contiguous Palestinian state, which I think is a good question. Mm -hmm. um, the answer uh, that I'm given is it's really a question of political will at the end of the day. And uh, there's a reason that many of these uh, former top Israeli security officials have formed an organization called Commanders for Israeli Security, which promotes this idea of a two-state solution. These are Zionists who support the state of Israel, 
but they believe that in order to make Israel more secure and in order to fulfill the Zionist dream of a Jewish and a democratic state, which Israel still is, uh, there needs to be a Palestinian state. And many of these people also support a Palestinian state for humanitarian reasons, for the Palestinians. Uh, but to answer the, 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 the Einstein quote, uh, which is a great quote, um, I want to just bring us back, uh, and this would be maybe a good note to end on as well, the uh, 50 years ago with uh, the Yom Kippur War. Uh, Anwar Sadat, president of Egypt, launched this war to regain the territories that he and the Syrians had lost in the 67 war. And um, from the Israelis' perspective, this is a man of war and somebody that they would never be able to trust. And when he uh, decided to uh, go ahead and make peace with Israel, this was considered much more insane than this idea of a two-state solution that we're talking about today, despite all the failures. And he announces four years after the surprise attack um, that he's going to visit Jerusalem and address the Israeli people in the Knesset. And uh, an Israeli pollster did a survey in Israel asking them, would you support returning the Sinai Peninsula uh, in exchange for peace with Egypt? The vast majority of Israelis, something like uh, three-fourths, said no. I mean, this was, this was the leader who attacked Israel uh, four years earlier. Many of them lost loved ones in the surprise attack, in this war. And um, after his uh, very uh, statesmanship-like uh, speech where he talked about wanting peace and he addressed Israeli people head on and said, no more war, this is a time of peace, he goes back to uh, Cairo and the same pollster conducts a new survey and finds that now, days later, three-fourths of the Israeli public support uh, land for peace. And I think this is you know, uh, a very, very important and poignant uh, kind of moment, which shows you that uh, psychology matters and that leaders matter. And I think that right now, uh, everyone is suffering from poor leadership. Uh, and, and I think that uh, it is not impossible to envision a day where leaders will take courage, will have the courage to take political risks uh, to make peace. I think it's absolutely possible, and there only, there's only one solution that's going to answer Israel's uh, security needs and Palestinians' uh, desire for uh, self-determination, and that is a two-state solution. I think we have to end there. That's it. If we've learned anything from this panel, is you have to go read and decide for yourself. So I want to thank Professor Gagziv, Professor Umusama Makdisi, Rachel Fish, and Khaled Al Gindi. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight, and have a good evening. <laughs>